our time together will unfold in the following way. Uh, Harry and Susanna will start us off with about 40 minutes of conversation um, about their book, and then I will jump in with some questions for them, and then we'll open up the floor um, for all of your questions. Will you please join me in very warmly welcoming Harry Brickhouse and Susanna <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Uh, I think we're both going to stand up here just so we can correct each other as we go along. But I want and, that. And tell each other what to do. Exactly. Oh, yeah, you know that. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is uh, work with Sonny Ladd, who's at Duke, and Adam Swift, who was at Oxford when we did this, and now is at University College London. Is that right? Yeah. 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 He has moved a lot in the last he couple has, of yeah. years. <laughs> Warwick. I don't know. OK. So our view going into this, we had, we had worked together for a number of years with a, a group studying uh, education, justice, and democracy. And we come to realize that uh, economists that Sonny and I had trained to be and philosophers could really speak to each other um, in ways that seemed to both of us to be productive because uh, we were able, I think, to help think about evidence and what evi how evidence can be used in decision making, and they were able to bring in this, uh, the values, these issues of values and how values could be used. And we realized that we could really think systematically about both when we were considering education policies, and that's what this book is essentially about. How could, is there a way that we could make it easy to kind of think systematically about uh, the, policy, the, the values that we care about when we're thinking about policy. So there was a lot of books written at the time, written now, about data-driven decision-making. You need the data, data should drive what you do, all of this stuff about data. But when it comes to it, data doesn't tell you what to do. You're, you're not driven by um, whatever data says. It's like a map. You need to know where you're going for the map to be useful. Data can inform decisions, but you're really instead driven by the values that you hold and the things that you want to get accomplished. So what we were trying to do in this book is to say, OK, well, what values are those that regularly come into play when you're thinking about issues of education? And, but you could easily apply this kind of same approach to other types of values. So in the way that we've put it together is really aimed at trying to make it easier, both for policymakers or for citizens when they're thinking about um, a policy, what kinds of values should they be thinking about, but also for those of us who do research, when we're thinking about what should we do research on, we want to do research that is informative for decision making so it should speak to the values that we hold. So we wanted to articulate a set of values that we think really come into play the most often when you're trying to make these decisions. Either the actual decisions which you know, real people make or the research decisions which we make okay, as researchers. And we've divided them for the purpose of this book into three different groups. The first is what we call educational goods. And those are the capacities, the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and dispositions that we want individuals to develop as they are educated, that education is the development of these capacities. So what are the capacities that we care about? And we can't go into each in the detail, but we try to, we try to present a list that creates a framework for thinking about what those capacities are, really a first step. The second is distributive values. We care not only about the average level of these things, but we care about the distribution of them, issues of equity. However, words like equity are super vague and really don't tell you what to think. And there are actually a few distributive values that we might hold, and so we want to talk about those. And those values might all seem the same, but they're really not. For example, helping the least advantaged might not give you the same thing as trying to make people as equal as possible. So there are different distributive values, and we might care about both of all of them, just like we might care about multiple kinds of educational goods, multiple kinds of capacities. And then the last set of values are independent values. Those are 
uh, additional things that we care about when we're thinking about education policy. Not everything about education policy is really about education. We might want to maintain our democracy. We might want to have enough funds for housing. There are, there are a whole bunch of other things we care about, and that's what the, the independent values are. So I think what we'd like to do in our in 30 minutes or something like that is to go through the educational goods, the distributive values, and the independent values, give you an example of how to apply them, give you a quick try at applying them to another example, and then open it up for Susan's questions and then other questions. So imagine a teacher. And she's there. You don't have to imagine her. Um, and she asks you, well, you've got this theory of educational goods. What educational goods should I be trying to develop in my students? There, they, there she is. She's got the students. And we have an answer. We've got a great answer for her, uh, which is that one. So the knowledge, skills, dispositions, and attitudes that enable children to flourish and contribute to the flourishing of others in the social context they'll inhabit. That is the, that's sort of the key answer to the question. Um, and you can imagine that at the, this point, she might not be terribly happy with us and think, OK, like, yeah, and what does that mean? So look, what we're not going to do and what we don't do in the book is give you something like the Common Core curriculum. We do not give you uh, exact curricular standards that you would use for every grade level for each subject. That would be, I think you realize, absurd for us to try and do that. Um, what we do instead is we uh, articulate six capacities that we think help you to organize your thinking about what you should be doing in the class, well, at, at the school level and at the classroom level. Um, six capacities that children are going to need in order to flourish themselves um, and in order to contribute to the flourishing of others. So I'm going to th go through those six very quickly before we get to, um, and then talk a little about, a bit about the distributive values. So the first, um, oh, I don't know, there, is the capacity for economic productivity. So the example I always use here is, of course, there are people who don't need to be economically productive. They can survive without it. Uh, Prince Charles, for example. I think you know who I'm talking about. He's uh, you know, that unemployed guy um, who's nevertheless very famous and rich. So he doesn't need to be economically productive, but most of us do. So not, not just in a capitalist economy, but in any other kind of economy you can imagine. Most of us uh, need to be able to contribute to the economy, not just because we need uh, to make a living, uh, but because that's part of what people need. They need to be contributors. They need not to just be um, uh, people who are, you know, getting resources uh, from others. Um, now, there are, there's a certain kind of rhetoric. I think you've heard it from, you know, from some politicians, uh, and mainly from, uh, we get it a lot in Wisconsin, where I'm from, that uh, our Republican politicians will often say, well, you know, education should all just be about the workplace and skills and whatever. And I want you not to react against that by rejecting this. I agree that it matters, but it's not all that matters. There are other capacities that matter too. Um, so I hope these are in the right order. So the second is capacity for democratic competence. And I think this is a, this is a good one for illustrating how um, different what you might need in order to have this capacity well developed might be in different circumstances. So uh, in... Um, and, Mainly you need this. I mean, you need this p to protect yourself because the uh, demo participation in the democratic process is a way of protecting your own interests. But it's also a way of uh, contributing to the flourishing of others. Um, when you ask the state to use uh, political power to change policy, you're affecting how other people uh, live, and you should try hard to get it right. What is involved in getting it right, so just think about the knowledge that you need in order to uh, actually be democratically competent. There are lots of different theories of democratic competence about just how, you know, just exactly how it works. But what you would need to know in the US is different from what you would need to know in the UK. So first of all, you'd want to know how US institutions work. Uh, there's really not much need to know how US institutions work if you grow up in the UK. It's quite context specific, that knowledge. Um, but I also think that U.S. Uh, institutions 
call on different kinds of competences and skills. So I counted at one point 15 levels of government that I vote at, uh, half of which are non-partisan, that is when I go to the ballot, uh, it doesn't tell me anything about the candidates at all except their names. Um, uh, and so I need, whereas in Britain, whenever I voted, there are political parties attached to the candidates' names, and I know a lot about those candidates, the, the, the parties, and I know how the parties have gone about selecting their candidates. Um, whereas here, you know, sometimes the candidates aren't even members of the party that they're the candidates for, as, uh, you know, but I think Bernie still isn't a member of the Democratic Party. I know he's not been their nominee, but. Um, uh, so the kinds of things that you need, uh, the kind of knowledge you need, but also the kinds of discernment that you need vary across uh, systems. Can I put one thing in, too, yeah. that I liked was just this idea that you need a capacity to take in information and change your mind. So there's like a discussion and debate aspect of the democratic process that, that is an important capacity to develop if we want the democratic process to work well. And so that would be an example. And maybe that uh, contributes to economic productivity, but not in all situations. Right. And so that's an important point, is that some of the, some of the concrete sort of knowledge, skills, and dispositions you need for some of these capacities will serve other capacities, too. So Su Susanna recruited me, along with Susan and many others, to do a project um, about California's schooling system. And my job uh, with, a, with, with a student of mine was to go through the state standards. Um, and we really did go through like, or, I mean, that, that was a lot of reading, right? Because uh, it goes grade level in great detail. But one of the things that we really observed was that um, our six competencies, our six capacities are quite um, well, real, sort of well um, articulated in the standards, in the California um, state standards. But it's not as though English language arts is about democratic competence and math is about personal autonomy, which is the next one I'll go to. Um, there's a lot of uh, intersection between them. So third capacity is a capacity for personal autonomy. In uh, complex um, modern societies, we have to make lots of decisions for ourselves. Um, some people think it's really important that those decisions really be truly our own decisions. But even if you didn't think that, um, I think I might be a better decision maker for some of my students um, than they will be. And I think I might systematically be a better decision maker than they will be about nearly everything in their lives. And some of them think that too. And they tell me that. Um, but I'm not wandering around with them all the time. Like, I'm not there to make the decision. In fact, in, 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 in the kind of societies we live in where you have to live your own life, um, you are the one making the decisions, and you want to. You need the, to be able to uh, match. You know, consider your values independently. Figure out how those values match with who you really are, um, and figure out how your decisions, um, what kinds of consequences your decisions will have, uh, not just in the circumstances for yourself, but for others. We also think that the capacity for healthy personal relationships. Um, is an important capacity. And I think, I mean, we think that because we think that for most people, maybe not everybody, uh, these are what lie at the sort of core of a flourishing life. Um, for most people, their relationships and making sure their relationships go well and being able to be generous in their relationships. Um, uh, and actually, sometimes healthy personal relationships might be antagonistic. Sometimes a healthy personal relationship might be a you know, the proper response to somebody might be to dislike them uh, and be in conflict with them. I think uh, I grew up British, in case you can't tell. Um, and, you know, we were taught basically to be totally repressed uh, and to be nice to everybody, however much we hate it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, you're Welsh. Like, it's, you know, I'm only English. Uh, and it might have been healthier if we'd had a bit more, um, you know, if we'd if been trained to be ourselves a bit more uh, rather than. We also identify the capacity for treating others as equals. Um, and this is a sort of two-way, I mean, some of these capacities, I think, contribute more to the flourishing of the person who has them. Others contribute maybe more to the flourishing of other people. Um, the capacity to treat others as equals I mean, I, I like this. I have a, I have a friend who t 
teaches at a university that's very well known and is on this coast and isn't that far from here, but I'm not going to name. <laughs> um, and he once said to me that, that, you know, there are two kinds of people in the world, there are two kinds of student in the world. There are students um, who need to learn that they're just as important as anybody else. Uh, and then there are the students who need to learn that they're no more important than anybody else. And his observation was that he had a lot of the latter. Um, uh, and th 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 they are defective. So it is defective not to be treat, able to treat others as equals um, because of the other people. But it's also probably in some ways uh, an, inhi an inhibitor of your own uh, flourishing and, and well-being. Um, if you can only treat other people in condescending ways or only in deferential ways, um, you are limited in your capacities uh, to develop relationships. The sixth capacity is the capacity for personal fulfillment. So on my, on, I printed all these out, but I printed them out in black and white. And so then every now and then something color comes up. I think, wow, that looks really, the bowling one looks really good, doesn't it? Um, uh, now, all of, the, all of these capacities are ones that we think schools can contribute to the development of con considerably. Um, uh, the capacity for personal fulfillment is, in a way, just everything left over after what we've talked about in the other capacities. But um, I sort of think of it as, I, here's my example. My example is I, I went to a high school um, my parents have, my dad has no interest in music at all still. He's 78 and he can't name you a song that he likes um, or a piece of music that he likes. My mother is a bit more musical, but I grew up, you know, with a very conventional kind of uh, musical um, exposure. And I went to a high school where I had a very, very strange teacher. He was a very strange economics teacher. He was actually extremely right wing. Um, no, that wasn't what was strange about him. Uh, he, he was strange in other ways. And he introduced me to English folk music, and I love English folk music. And I developed a deep uh, love of it, which I would never have gotten if I'd been limited to the exposure that I got from my own family and community. Um, it's been very meaningful to me. Um, uh, there are lots of things that you, that you learn about yourself and that you, uh, enthusiasms that you can develop um, only if you get outside of your family. And the school is a very good place to get outside of your family. Um, go on. You, 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 Suzanne has a favorite. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, can you imagine which of these is my favorite? Um, so what I like about this idea of personal fulfillment and this idea that you need, so you need to actually develop capacities for it is just the idea of jokes that one of the nice things in the world is to be able to share jokes with others, but you have to, it, it requires a knowledge base. And so there's a knowledge base, for example, associated with the joke at the end that uh, I kind of like. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't get Harry to say jokes, so, so I don't know. All right, so, so here's, here's the, so <laughs> since you're Welsh, you'll have it. So there is the, there is the great English joke um, that you tell to Americans. Why, does that, why did the hedgehog cross the road to see his flatmate? So why is that funny? Well, you don't have hedgehogs, and you call flatmates roommates. And what you don't know is that hedgehogs get splattered flat in the middle of the road. So you have to know all those things in order to <laughs> laugh at the joke, which you didn't, because you don't. So there you are. Um, so we care? That's it. There are six. That's you it. There are six. six we, we, we got We've six. Yeah, we have. So I'll say a bit about the distributive values, and we're going to go very quickly through this because we want to talk about the independent values. Um, one of the things that irritates me enormously about educational discourse as a philosopher is the use of the word equity. I was in a meeting the other day where there, where there were a whole lot of people talking, and some, somebody was talking about, we, we were actually making decisions about uh, hiring uh, somebody in student affairs. And some people were saying, well, you know, yeah, that one had a great equity lens. And then somebody said, yeah, but, but not a very good social justice lens. I just thought, what, what, what are we talking about here? I don't know what equity is. I don't know what social justice is. Like, I mean, I know that they're good. But um, we, equity is basically, as I think social justice is, a kind of, a kind of code word for good things that I don't really want to explain to you in any detail what it is that I'm talking about. Um, 
Uh, and of course, you could get into an enormous amount of detail, and we don't do that in the book. We talk about three main values, uh, distributive values. Um, uh, that's all right. No, that was all right. Um, one uh, is equality. So one thing people care about when they talk about um, uh, distribution is equality. I, I think when people talk about diminishing inequalities, um, they often care somewhat about equality, and I think equality matters. So I think it would be good, uh, other things being equal, but only other things being equal, if we all emerged into the labor market um, and the world um, with uh, equally valuable capabilities and capacities. Now, there, to, in order to achieve that, we'd have to do all sorts of things that we are rightly not willing to do, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't be a good thing, other things being equal. So I think we have reason to care about equality of capacity because I think we've got reason to care about equality of opportunity. Um, another value that is often talked about, especially in the American context, is adequacy. Now, you know, the truth is about adequacy, you could, you can interpret adequacy many different ways. Um, uh, we interpret it roughly as this, that, you know, adequacy is ensuring that everyone has the educational goods that would uh, enable them to have a reasonable chance of attaining some threshold level of overall flourishing as adults. The third value, and these are all different values, is benefiting the less advantaged. And I, I will say that we don't say this in the book, um, and so it's not our official view, and Susanna may not agree with it, but I'll just say it now. When I think about the American education system and I think about how I want um, uh, resources and educational goods and opportunities to be distributed, the first thing in my mind is benefiting the less advantaged. The first, the, the major, most urgent priority to me is focusing on the flourishing uh, over the long, uh, over the course of the life of the people who have the least educational uh, success, who are going to be in the bottom 30, 35 percent of the labor market, who are going to have insecure, not interesting jobs, where they are going to be uh, subject to the arbitrary power of managers who have very little incentive uh, to care about their well-being um, and m are very limited in competence, um, who won't have secure housing, et cetera, et cetera. So when I, when, when I, think, about the, when I think about the immediate sort of short to medium term about the education system, that's what I care about most in terms of distribution. Now, I'll get, I'll, I'm going to come to you. So we care about the, these goods and we care about distribution. However, I use the term other things being equal every, uh, you know, a couple of times. And there are values that we couldn't really fit into the framework either in terms of go educational goods or distribution that we think really matter and that sometimes have to be traded off against both of those. So Susanna's going to talk about them. Okay. I'm actually going to give one more thing on this, just to show how it comes into play a little bit. So let's say I agree with Harry and that benefiting the less advantaged or the least advantaged may be the place that I would start. But then in some situations, um, particularly when you're thinking about allocating educational goods, there are some uh, difficulties that individual students have so that if you were only focused on benefiting the less advantaged, think of kind of s extreme uh, mental disabilities, essentially. Extreme cognitive disabilities. If we put all our efforts there, we might uh, allow so many people not to be able to reach at least a sufficient or adequate level of um, some kinds of educational goods so that they can flourish, particularly in our, our society where we've chosen not to have much of a safety net at all. So that might move me more to adequacy. But I'd be in adequacy and I, I would think, okay, well, don't I care that we have this income distribution and really this educational distribution that's got this huge uh, high end that really may be hurting everybody um, and bringing down that level that, of adequacy, essentially not allowing people to get as far as we might want them. And that would lead me to think, okay, well, we're in a society where I want to be thinking about equality too. So all of that is pointing to the fact that we might be thinking about all three of these things at once, just like we might be thinking about um, improving students' achievement and their social-emotional skills and their, their ability to have you know, positive interpersonal relationships. We might be thinking about all of those at the same time. Okay, so now going on to the last group. Good. Okay, so independent values. So we have six of the six educational goods. We have three. Um, 
distributive principles, I think we have five independent values. And the first one is very tied to education, but it isn't the development of capacities. It's what we call childhood goods. And what childhood goods are the experiences in you know, the economics term, the, almost the consumption during childhood. Kids are children for 18 years. We care about what their experiences are there and how much joy they have, even if they aren't developing the kinds of capacities that will lead to these benefits later on. So we really want to think about those kinds of things as well. And not only because it's a big chunk of your life do we care about their consumption during that time, but it's also a very specific time of life where they have this kind of opportunity to discover and create and do things like that that we may, most of us in this room, except maybe one, might um, not have at this uh, moment. And so, th so we want to really think about childhood goods. And so we're th if we're putting students in a kind of world, for example, that is, that is really debilitating, even if it does later lead to goods, we, uh, we still might not want to do it. So it, childhood goods is the first. Other goods is the second, you know, ice cream. We may not want to give up ice cream in total in order to, um, in order to focus all of our resources, for example, on the education of the next generation. Okay, so ice cream is a small example. Housing is a bigger example, right? That there are other things that we care about um, that, that we may uh, want to make trade-offs, particularly when we're making education policy. So that's two. The third is parents' interest, and this is a little bit trickier. That parenting, well, one is some people just believe that parents have a fundamental interest in their kids and should be allowed to make decisions for their kids. And we might weight these values differently, and as we'll talk about, all of these things we might weight differently. So we're just giving you a set, and then you have to decide how to weight them. Um, independent values may come into con uh, conflict with some of with developing some of the educational goods that uh, we might like, particularly, for example, because we allow parents' interest, we also allow parents to read to their children and invest in their children in a whole bunch of different ways that could lead to, to inequality. And it doesn't mean that um, parents' interest is necessarily bad. I happen to think it's kind of one of the fundamental things about being a person, that it's, it's like a benefit. There are lots of ways that you get joy, but one of the ways you get joy is in your, the parent-child relationships, and uh, we may want that as part of a society. A good job they couldn't hear us when we were talking before the thing, just complaining about our children. <laughs> our children. Yeah, other. they only bring us joy at every moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just like our dogs. Uh, sorry, you just like, ate everything in my house. I was away for the weekend. Okay, the next one is individual choice and freedom. We just p feel that people should have the ability, particularly adults, to make their own decisions. The ones that often come to play in educational policy are the choice of residence and the choice of occupation. We have difficulty in the U.S., I think, one of the reasons we have difficulty providing uh, kind of more similar or <laughs> equitable schools is because we have so much residential segregation. But we can't, we can't force people to live uh, where they don't want to live. Similarly, we can't force people to be teachers. So we, we can do incentives and things like that, but, but issues of individual choice and freedom come in. We have to think about those in a number of the education policy decisions. Um, and then I think this is the final one, is the democratic process. Some things like individual choice and, almost, and, and also the democratic process are not just independent values. Sometimes they're basically restrictions on the decisions that we can make. So we may want to reallocate resources as a, as a policymaker, but may not be able to maintain our position if we do that. We have to, we have to make choices um, that will allow re-election or that uh, respond to the democratic process. So those... Those are the independent values. And now we're going to use them. Yes? Well, we're going to, yeah. Almost. Yeah, almost. Okay. So um, the, the book, so the book is called Educational Goods. And what we're really interested in is education. Um, but in the, we, we have three chapters which are, so there are a number of chapters which articulate the values and a, a number of chapters, there's a chapter which articulates 
a kind of method for thinking about values and evidence together, so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but then we have three chapters, one about school accountability, one about school financing, and one about school choice. And so you can tell from the word school in that, in all those chapters, that what we, what we talk about really is schooling. Um, and schooling is not the only way that people get educated. And if we didn't have schooling, it wouldn't be at all the way they get, got educated. They'd get educated some other way. Um, but it is the primary lever used by government. So it's something that governments um, have you have direct capacity to have some control and influence over. Um, and so that's why, that's why we thought it was important to use school-based examples, um, even, though, you know, even though things that parents do matter too. OK. So look, I'm, I'm going to skip through yeah, this. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So what, what, what we should look, yeah, let's we can, you want to do this? You can no, 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 we'll okay. go through Let, Let's go through all of this and go to the, the method. Okay. Right. So, we have these values. We've articulated roughly what the values are. How do we use them? So, we, by the way, we, in articulating the um, method that we describe, we don't really think, I don't think we are telling people to do something particularly new. What we're doing is maybe, I think we're really codifying, in articulating the values, I think by and large we're codifying what people already think. It's just that they don't think it very explicitly. Um, and then in the process that we describe, we're codifying something that I think people generally do. I have the, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I, I grew up with educational decision makers, like in my house, talking about these things all the time, so I kind of know how, how, you know, I know how those ones thought, anyway. Um, uh, and what, sorry, I don't know why. Go back, go back, go back. Why am I going back? You were skipping charters? No, we'll go back to that in a minute. Oh, I want, okay, I want no, to talk no. about the, uh, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got things in the wrong order. So, um, <laughs> there we go. I want to talk about the process. So, what, here's what we think people, mo sort of, you know, morally responsible decision makers do. They, people make decisions in context and they have in front of them possibilities, and they're constrained by those contexts. You know, we make history uh, not, in, not in circumstances of our own choosing, and most of us don't really make history. We make small decisions about this, that, or the other, which will have, you know, moderate effects in normal situations. And so there are two kind of initial stages, and you might do them in either order, depending. One is identifying what values are likely to be in play, and the other is identifying key re relevant decisions. So around charter schools, we'll go back to charter schools in a moment, but around charter schools, you know, your decision might be, um, if you are in California in 1990, shall we have charter schools? Shall we pass charter school legislation? And if so, what will it look like? But your decision could equally well be, if you're um, on, a, on a school board in Wisconsin, uh, shall we charter this school? Right? Um, those are very different decisions. I think different uh, values may be in play in the two cases, um, given the difference in situation. Uh, what you want is you want, the, you want to think about what values are at stake. You want to know what evidence is relevant in the circumstances you're in uh, relative to those values that are really at stake. And then you need to assess the options in the light of the values and the, uh, the, the values you have reason to care about and the evidence uh, that you have, or that if you've got good responsible social scientists, you've been able to get them uh, to find for you. Then you establish the best policy in your circumstances. So before we talk about charter schools, I just want to say why we didn't do this fourth stage in the book. So we articulate um, the values. We talk in great detail, well, we discuss, describe the process, we talk in great detail about three different kinds of decisions, and we really focus those, those on really state and district level decision makers in, in, in those cases. Um, but what we don't do is tell you what you should think about charter schools or what you should think about school financing or what you should think about accountability. So why don't we do that? There are two reasons. The main reason, the really important reason, is we were trying to provide an intellectual resource for people who might actually be making these decisions. 
and we think two things. One is that, you, that reasonable people can give different weights to the values, and that's a process through which you have to think things through, and we hoped that by articulating we could help people do that. And the other is that people will read the actual evidence differently, right? And reasonable people can read the evidence differently because the evidence on lots of the issues um, is not complete. It's not uh, exactly uh, complete. There's another reason, uh, which is one of the reasons that we know those two things, which is that among the four of us, we probably do weigh the values uh, differently. And for sure, we read some of the evidence differently. So if we tried to do four, um, we would have failed, I think, because I think we would have been unable uh, to agree because of those. I will say I think, I suspect that <laughs> Susanna and I, although we do weigh the values differently, probably could have come to agreement more easily uh, than we could have all four come to. Well, any two would have come to agreement more easily than any. Yeah, good. Almost. Good. Any two. Yeah, not, maybe not any two. <laughs> um, so, but that gave us evidence that, you know, that, that, so we, what we didn't want to do was um, alienate readers by doing this fourth thing, which is what we want them to do. We don't, we don't I mean, yeah, we do want to do it in other work or, in a, or as citizens or whatever, but we want them to, to have this resource. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going to go back now and let's talk about charter schools. Do school. a quick charter schools and then do the example? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to go back and you can, uh, you can do the charter schools now. Okay. Bet you got that. Okay, so let's just go to here. So basically, you, you all know what charter schools are. Let's say I'm deciding whether or not to put charter schools in. What I, whoops, what I want to do is think of how my decision will be impacted by all the values that we've identified. So I want to think of the educational goods. I want to think of the childhood goods, the other goods, the parents' interest, individual choice the democratic process, and I want to think about their distributions in terms of equality, adequacy, and benefiting the less advantaged. And so when I think about putting in char more charter schools, I think, OK, well, that may affect the level and distribution of educational goods, and it actually might affect which ones, both because charters are um, very heavily focused on tests test-based accountability in most places, but in some places they also have kind of parents' preferences and the outcomes the parents care about. Okay, so it might affect both of those things. It could definitely affect childhood goods for the same reason. It probably doesn't do much to other goods because we're not talking about changing the amount of money going into education or anything like that, so we can take other goods off uh, for now. Parents' interest, it definitely affects, right? Because parents can now have additional choice. And um, the other two, the individual choice and the democratic process, it really doesn't do much for that. It doesn't change what occupations people can choose or anything. So if I want to think what values are in play, I think educational goods, childhood goods, and parents' interest. And I'm interested in both the level and um, the distribution. OK, so then I go and I go to the research. And I say, what's out there? Well, on the positive side, it's, there's general sense that it uh, positive, positively affects the distribution of parents' interest, meaning that it becomes more equal, that parents can, more parents can make choices for their kids now, whereas before you needed kind of an income, enough income or wealth to be able to make a choice for your parents now, uh, for your children now more. Uh, parents can, parent satisfaction, the, the, the research shows parent satisfaction uh, goes up. And there for some, this is important, for some low-income students, there are substantial gains from the, their ability to go to charter schools. On the negative side, you have greater quality variation. So actually, the distribution of achievement probably goes up instead of narrows. So equality may go down. And it somewhat increases segregation. But really. We still have relatively sparse research base, except for test score effectiveness. Um, and we don't know the effects on other schools. We just know the test score effectiveness of charters. 
So if I was going to the evidence, it gives me a little bit. It speaks to my values a little bit, but not exactly like I would want to. I would go back and say, okay, which educational goods does it affect? What distribution does it affect? And I'd want it to know it not just for the kids in charter schools, but for other places as well. And this is a very good example of how this kind of um, approach can help you think about what research you want to do. Because when we, when we were doing this, one of the things that we were struck by was lots of claims about how, um, for example, the KIPP schools affect other schools and basically no evidence about it at all. And, I mean, it's really difficult to find evidence about how, you know, a basically quite small schools affect much larger systems that they're nested within. Um, but as far as we could see, the, you know, people just hadn't done that at all. There's lots of evidence about how KIPP schools affect the kids who are um, admitted into KIPP, and there are lots of claims, positive and negative, about how... Uh, those schools affect other kids, and very little evidence indeed. So one thing we wanted to do, because this is all kind of esoteric, sorry for jumping around, is to give you an example to think about yourself and to talk about. Um, and what, what I'd like to try is this one. I think it gives a kind of more concrete sense of how you might use something like this actually in trying to think about either your own decision for a policy or a practice or um, your own decision about what research to do. So in the New York Times last May, there was an article about why New York schools uh, uh, are segregated. It's not as simple as housing. And basically what the article was about was about the school choice system. So what it said is that um, there's a choice system in New York and black students are most likely not to attend their neighborhood school. So black students in the city were much more likely to be making ch the choices than other students. White and Asian students were the least likely to be making choices. However, when white and higher income families and Asian families live in a diverse or gentrifying neighborhood, they're more likely to send their children into other places. So even though they were making fewer decisions to leave their neighborhood schools, the decisions that they were making were, were increasing the segregation in the schools, while the black students were making more choices but were not increasing the segregation in the schools by those choices. When white choose, students chose, they chose more white schools. When black students chose, they didn't. Okay, so then what you have is a real really unequal distribution of achievement across schools in the city. It's not the greatest table, but it just gets pulled from there. And um, uh, where, for example, if you look at um, white students, only 13% are in the, bull, the, the below 25 percentile, but 30% of black students are. So you've got big inequalities in achievement. So let's say there's some political will to reduce the inequality and achievement in the city. And they're considering two different possibilities. They're considering reducing choice and desegregating strategically, so trying to provide desegregated schools, or to reallocate funds to schools with more students in need, more low-achieving students, more low-income students, other uh, more you know, black students that black students are facing to the extent that black students are facing additional needs. Okay, so they can either get rid of the choice and strategically desegregate, or they can reallocate funds. So then you would go to this, this thing and say, okay, which educational goods are in play, which independent values are in play, and which distributive values are in play? And then in step three, what you would do is you would assess how these different options, either the, the reducing choice or the reallocating funds, would affect um, these different, the, the different values that are in play, and then you make your choices. Okay, so what I would like you all to do is just to turn to the person next to you and for five minutes think of which educational goods are in play, which independent values are in play, and which distributive values are in play. And then, so just for five minutes, think about what you would want to know, what, what values you think are in play, and then we'll switch for five minutes and think about what evidence you would most want. Like, what kind of evidence would you want to make your decision? 
in uh, part four, and then that will we'll discuss that for a minute, and then we'll open it up to Susan. Good. Okay, yeah. turn to the so, person next to you. And five talk. Minutes and yeah. talk. <laughs> and introduce yourself. Do you know everybody here? No. Oh. Most people. Oops, sorry. It's a good thing I didn't rip that. Okay, you ready to switch to what evidence you would want most want to get? Yes. Okay, what evidence? Like also, I guess, 
Survey. <laughs> so you want to know yeah. that? Observations and school report cards and things like that. Uh, so we want the effectiveness yeah. of adequacy funding programs. And so if we were if, mm -hmm. if we were to reshuffle and to desegregate the schools, would um, ensuring the adequacy mm -hmm. floor actually make sure that all the, right. all the kids really had what they needed? So right. evidence on that. Um, yeah. yeah, so you might think, I mean, if you might think. you thought these different options would affect educational goods? Well, I have a question. Um, so we discussed current consumption because of the choice of reallocating funds. Those oh, funds yeah. would have to come from somewhere. Yeah. So I was just wondering if that was the correct way to kind of think about current consumption. You, you could think about that, or they could just reduce the spending in schools serving higher income students. I mean, so so in a, so this is important. To, it, it, what we've assumed here, so we've assumed things about what's feasible. I mean, we've assumed them because we've assumed it is true because you're working under our assumptions here. We've assumed. So for some, you know, some, for, look, 
for some decision makers, neither of those things might be feasible options. We've assumed that they're both feasible options, that you can do one or the other. And because you've earned yourself a political space to do it, or because nobody's really watching very carefully, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Um, so, so just to say, I think, um, I actually think uh, decision makers in the UK, um, in the mid 2000s, were confronted with pretty much exactly this choice about socio not not racial segregation, but socioeconomic segregation. And I think that central government decision makers effectively made the first, sorry, the second choice. They thought there's, it's going to be very costly, and we're not confident that we can do it well to, uh, de you know, to desegregate by social class. And so what we're going to do effectively is harness the fact that we've got all these children who are alike in one school as a way of targeting resources at them. So we've got a whole bunch of working class kids in a school. When we throw resources into that school, there aren't upper middle class parents trying to grab them because their the, the kids aren't in the school. Um, and so I think that was, I mean, I think this was, I think this does represent the way that some central government decision makers were thinking in the mid-2000s in, mid in, in, in the UK. And I think they, I mean, to be honest, I think probably two was I know two was feasible because they did it. I'm not sure how feasible one was, but, you know. Uh, and what's feasible depends on your circumstances. And so that's why we had to make up what was feasible for you, because we didn't want you having to make that. So if you think of something like treating people as equals, which one do you think would likely be a better approach? The reallocation. Well, well, the spillover effects of increasing for desegregation, right, would seemingly be greater and therefore would, what was the, what was the, the, the I was thinking the, about treating each uh, treating as, as equals. equals, but it could be, well, it could be that it would, that desegregation would improve it because people would be, um, students of different backgrounds would be interacting with each other, but they'd have to do it well for it to, to uh, lead to that kind of an outcome. It doesn't also depend on other aspects of how the school is set up. So what if you have a tracking system in the schools and you end up predictably with certain kinds of students in one track and others in another? And then what you've done is a really effective way of getting everyone to feel even more different because they're up to school but taking different classes. So I grew up in Southern California. In my schools, we had the honors classes and the honors classes, and there was one Mexican kid in my honors classes, and all the other Mexican kids were in the non-honors classes. And we was obviously set up, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't make anyone feel like anyone was being treated as equal. It just emphasized the sense in which they were being treated unequally in the rest of society. So that would be it. That's a great example of kind of evidence that you would want that one or the other that that if you desegregated the schools, it would benefit these these kinds of problems. I have a question about the goals. Are they supposed to be time invariant? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so, so here, here's why I say it so hesitantly. So I think, look, the, 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 the goal of flourishing, that is something that, that's what we care about human beings have, have, having. So that, that, that's something that we, so that is completely time invariant. I mean, it's time and space, time and context invariant. That's what we care about. Um, for, at least for modern societies, the capacities that we describe, so some of them, I think, the capacity to have healthier emotional relationships, um, for human beings, like that's essential for flourishing, all times and spaces. How, what you need in order to have that capacity varies by time and context. There are other, th you know, or, you know the, the obvious one that might not be time invariant is democratic competence. Because if you don't live in a democratic society, and you have no prospect of living in a democratic society, 
exactly, you know, maybe democratic competence isn't the right word to describe what we what we have reason to care about. But we care about fulfillment, we care about e economic participation, we care about autonomy. So, but, uh, you, oh, I'm throwing it back to you. Well, I guess it was hard, at least for me, to um, answer these questions because if I'm thinking of a policymaker making this decision, oh, sorry if my voice is quiet. Um, <laughs> If I'm thinking of a policymaker making this decision, they're weighing different goods and different values. They might have an interest in valuing some over others, right? Based on their time frame that they're working oh. under, uh, yeah. which I think is a little different than. Well, so you mean so you're thinking about time horizon? So you're thinking about like could would you could. expect a policymaker to say, well? I if I want to desegregate because I think this regarding others is equal will be will work out in the long term, Good. but maybe yes. at right. the beginning it's right. gonna there's a transition oh, period. Sorry, I totally misunderstood your question, and that that's much harder to answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we so, so we don't talk in the book. So there are two sort of things that we don't talk about much in the book. So one is your level of risk aversion. So. You know, for most of the time, when you're choosing between two things, it's not like you know they're going to work out. You know that there's some probability that anything will work out. Um, and if you know me in my personal life, I'm extremely risk averse. Probably more risk averse than I would than I ought to be when I'm making decisions on behalf of other people. But when you're making decisions on behalf of other people, you should be somewhat risk averse. And some people are. You know, my father-in-law is totally reckless, and he shouldn't be that way when he's making decisions for other people. Um, so that's one element, and then the other is time horizons. Um, and I just think that the, the longer your time horizon, the less confidence you should have that what you're doing is going to have any effect, or the effects that you're looking for. And so I do think that politicians normally, in normal circumstances, is having short to medium time horizons, not because they're afraid of being re-elected, but because they just, you, you can control the present better than you can control the future. Um, but sometimes you might think, sometimes you might rightly think, well, this will have a payoff in 10, 15 years time, or longer. And yeah, in the short term, it's going to be a mess. But the chances of there being that payoff are so great. Yeah, so we don't talk about that very much at all. And, and, maybe, I, and we should really. And this might is a very good example of it. Like you might need to have some kind of baseline of integration of groups in order to, in the future, be able to, you know, you to to get the kind of outcomes you need. Even though those outcomes might depend on, you know, changing the tracking systems or whatever in the schools that you have. Just a question about something you said earlier, Susanna, to follow up on it. So where exactly do opportunities for persuasion come up? Is it once evidence has been presented or, you know, where, because... Yeah. So one is it comes up in that we believe that that's one of the capacity. So we, uh, what guess, Harry's what saying... And by, too? Is it just the evidence or what? Yeah, so what, what Harry's saying is that these um, bigger things like economic productivity don't change, but the little parts of it within economic productivity, what you need to be productive changes over time. We don't need to be as strong as we used to be to be economically productive, for example. There are other kinds of things. So within these things, time changes it, even if the big things don't change. Persuasion is interesting because that comes both because um, one of the competencies we need in a democracy is to be able to be persuaded, basically, to persuade and to be able to, to, to be in those kinds of conversations. So it comes up as a skill, but it also comes up um, as kind of the purpose of what we're doing, which is not, uh, we, we got a lot of pushback initially because we weren't dealing with the decision, the, like the policy making process. And the goal of this isn't to deal with the policy making process because different, because I will give up something in order to get something I really want, even though I like that thing, for example. And so there's a whole kind of policy making trade off kind of a process that goes on. What this is doing is trying to help individuals be clear within their own mind about what they want so that they go into that policy making process or that debate process with a clearer view of what they really think is important, where they're not quite sure um, 
you know, where they're more willing to be persuaded or not to be persuaded. So in some ways, this is less about the persuasion and more about the preparation for persuasion. Did that? Yeah, that makes sense. Don't the answers to all of these questions, depend, oh, I'm sorry. Don't the answers to all these questions depend upon the production function for these educational goods, which we haven't talked about? Well, that's what the evidence is, right? Isn't that like how these things contribute? That's what the that's what we want evidence on, is the production function for these good for these educational goods. But often we just get production functions for achievement. Well, that's and, right. Don't and that might be one of the things that we care about, but it doesn't help us in the production of positive interpersonal uh, interpersonal relations or even like positive ability to be autonomous, that kind of stuff. So that's, we're arguing for production functions of multiple outcomes. Yeah, and we have a whole chapter about achievement gaps. And so we didn't really talk about this. So, you, you know, Susanna gave you this achievement data in math. Um, achievement data is, like what does it measure? It measures how well you do on standardized tests. What is that a proxy for? Well. Actually, large gaps are probably proxies for large gaps in what we really have reason to care about, which is the capacities we develop. Small gaps, maybe not. And actually, in improvements, maybe not, because if the improvements are to do with gaming or whatever, then, then, then not. Um, but I'm reasonably convinced that the very large gaps that we see are meaningful in the terms that we have reason to care about, but, but it's very hard to... In, I mean, you know, what we love would be much better measures of the kind of learning we have reason to care about, than we, right? I mean, that's what we'd really like to have. But if there are weird threshold effects, you could actually wind up with situations where yes. you actually take away from someone and shaft them and do nothing for the people sure. here. Sure, absolutely, that's right. Yeah. And I think that's what we're trying to think about with this basket. I think the idea that you have this basket of educational goods that give you this capacity to flourish um, makes you realize that, okay, well, one person can be good at achievement and maybe another person's good at interpersonal relationships, and both those things likely contribute to your flourishing. And you don't have to equalize all of those. You just have to equalize the kind of overall flourishing part of it. That said, if there are big gaps in the things that you measure, in most of the things that you measure between groups that you think should not have those gaps, then they can be proxies for kind of gaps in the full basket instead of just gaps in the individual capacities. Yeah, um, I guess picking up on that, like I really appreciate this value framework. Um, and maybe what you're getting at is that perhaps we don't have the proper measurements to, to get at each of these values um, and thus we need to use proxies but I guess one of the the biggest question for me taking this value system is is what additional measures should we be looking at and um, yeah maybe you almost like like for each bullet point it seems like there might be like a, a set of, of measurements that could apply. So that's what we're doing for at dinner tomorrow night. So I, I, I think that's the next step in this, actually, is to think, like, what measures are there that could capture some of, it, we're never going to measure all of this perfectly. But if, we're, if there are big areas that we think we're really not measuring and could tell us a very different story if we measured them, then I think we do want to measure them. And I think that's particularly important if we're caring about things more than economic productivity, for example. Like, I think we are moving towards a broader view of economic productivity. People are measuring social emotional skills because they think it contributes to the workforce. But if we're not solving kind of huge problems in the world, there may be capacities that we're really not thinking about that would allow us to address things that are broader and, and maybe even more important uh, than the, the economic productivity right now. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around the list, and I'm wondering, you know, on the one hand, why isn't national unity or creativity? I mean, there are a lot of other values that could have been put on the list of educational goods, right? So one question is, why this versus some other list, and doesn't it describe a particular worldview that has a certain set of rank orders among these. 
And then the other problem I'm having is on the distributional values, adequacy and priority to the less advantaged just seem to me to be suboptimal versions of the, the first good, w which would be to provide everybody with equal opportunity to whatever you decided was th the list. And so the openness of the list and then the nature of the distributional values appearing to be kind of suboptimal choices leaves me with like, what am I really operationalizing? You, you take the first, I'll take the second, or you can okay. you go first. I was going to go with the second oh, and then the first. Good. But, but that's so, right. that was easier. <laughs> all right, all right, well, I do the first. So, um, so just about creativity, I just, I, yeah, no, no, I, hang on on national unity. I'll say something about that in a minute because I find that one easier. Um, I think one of the things that was very interesting going through the California state standards, and it has standards for 10 or 12 subject areas, and it was a lot of reading, right? And one of the things that's clear is that, you know, they talk about creativity. I would say for some values, uh, and I think creativity does matter, I think spirituality matters, um, but I think that those are, depending on how you conceive, I mean, there are different ways of conceiving the six capacities we talked about. I think you can capture those things, capture everything that you care about about creativity uh, in, a, in the right conception of our values. I mean, look, we didn't write, we wrote one short book, um, and, and we don't really argue for the values much because it's really one chapter, and, and we wanted to, you know, we, we thought we might lose our audience. Um, we, we were right if we tried to do that. Um, one chapter, but, but like four years. <laughs> yeah, 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 it took us a long time to, to do it. Um, but I, so I, I think creativity, I think spirituality probably is, can be captured in there. I mean, maybe it, maybe we should have made it more explicit. So national unity, like, uh, yeah, there are people who care about national unity. And national unity, I mean, it matters to the extent that you need it in order to have a functioning, you know, democratic society. You know, sufficient lack of national unity. But that, you know, that's why democratic competence matters. Um, but it doesn't matter beyond that. And if we could have that, so if you want... If you want to put national unity on the table, we can argue about the value of national unity um, and how to conceive of it. I'm not going to, but I don't think you're going to do that because I don't think you really think national unity matters. So, so when, it, so, so when I, so when, it, when I encounter the person who thinks it matters, um, then we can, then, then we'll argue about it, and we, we will argue about it, like Susanna will too. We, we, we'll argue it through. Um, so yeah, sure, it does. I mean, at one level, like, if you really want to argue with the values, that's great. We can have that argument. I don't think, I, I, I th and I think we'll win it. No, I mean, I, I, I think it's because I think we're basically what right. we want is this is a tool for how people already think. If I were doing creativity, yeah. I'd put it in a combination of personal fulfillment and economic productivity, and that yeah. creativity contributes to both of those things. Yeah. Well, that's, so not, rank that's, order. that's not rank order. Whichever, yeah. Right, but I mean, I'm not sure that I, I mean, maybe as in a way for individuals to get a handle on what they value, that this kind of, but I'm trying to figure out, I mean, I don't find the, the, the impetus to find out the production function for healthy personal relationships in relationship to equality or adequacy or priority of, to the lesson. I, I, I don't see how to operationalize any of that. Well, that's why we need social scientists to do work on measures and operationalization. Like, you know, there's one, there's one, there's one picture where what you do is you, you know, you, you think about what you've already measured and you know how you can measure and there's another way you try and fi figure out how to measure what you really value. And some, a lot of what we really value is not easily measured but, you know, a lot of what we really value in education, that's not what people have been trying to measure. Um, maybe. Yeah. Well, let's get a couple of uh, additional questions too. One, two, three. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, 
I'm wondering if any of the, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm wondering how many of these educational goods that you've identified are goods that we um, can direct, goods that we can sort of intentionally or um, deliberately pursue versus which educational, which of these, if any of these goods are states that are byproducts of other goals. So personal fulfillment seems like an obvious example of something that's very hard to pursue directly because of the familiar, you know, sort of paradox of hedonism thing. Um, we could argue about others. I, I think democratic competence might be one of the other, one of these other sort of states that's primarily a byproduct. Um, it seems like whenever I've had to go through a training, I'm like, here's how we should talk to each other. When that's the direct goal of the exercise, nobody takes it seriously because nothing's actually at stake. Um, so that seems to, th this is not, an, of course, an objection to the list, but it, this seems, it might be relevant for policymakers in terms of driving a wedge between the measures that you'll want to use and the like interventions you'll want to make and um, the measures that you'll use to record success or measure, measure outcomes. I mean, I, you, you understand that better than I do, but just one, one thing. I, I think that there's some of these kinds of things where we, it's going to be very hard to measure an individual gaining these capacities. That said, we might think that there are big differences in the opportunities. Like if there's no green space for kids to play in, or they don't have access to some other kinds of things, then they won't have this kind of opportunity to explore or to develop uh, interests or things like that that we might think would be useful later on. So I agree that like to go and say, I'm gonna target this and I'm gonna try to get it, it's gonna be difficult, but it doesn't mean that we can't think about whether we can create experiences that are more or less likely to lead to these kinds of outcomes. Yeah, so I mean, I totally agree. Some, some of these, some of the knowledge skills, I mean, knowledge, some of the knowledge involved in that democratic competence can be directly taught. Um, uh, and often that's all that gets taught, right? Because it can be directly taught. Um, some of the other stuff uh, can't be, but you, that, so for different levels of decision maker, that has different implications. So it may, it may actually be that state level or federal level decision makers just think, well, there's nothing we can really do much about this particular good. That doesn't mean that a uh, district um, uh, professional development uh, leader can't do anything, or that a principal can't do anything, or that a teacher can't do anything, because they can do stuff to make it more likely that that byproduct will occur. For example, by instead of teaching people, oh, what you need to do is learn how to talk to each other properly, putting them in pedagogical situations where they need to learn how to talk to each other properly, and where they're given the right kinds of structures and supports and guidances. So, uh, Eric? So this is more a, a comment than a, than a question, but I listen with great interest because I teach policy analysis here in the MPA program. And this framework meshes, I think, in many ways very well uh, with how we try to teach a framework for thinking systematically about the costs and benefits of different options. One of the contributions that I really see is, as you said, this can really be a tool for helping people think about what they value. So a lot of times when I'm dealing with students or advocates, they, are, they often start with the policy solution. Yeah. They become an advocate for a yeah. particular thing. I want smaller class sizes. I, I want more funding for this program. But what they need to do is step back and think about what are the values they care about, and then systematically analyze a range of different options to achieve those values. And they may be surprised that actually some other policy might be better and may or may be equally as good on the value they care about, but it's going to have all these other benefits along all these other dimensions. And so I think broaden, you know, forcing people or compelling people to think more carefully about, you. really, people don't care about policy, they care about social outcomes. And people don't reflect enough on that. And the, the other thing I would say is, to me, this is a kind of a nice exemplar. It's filling a gap. There's generic policy analysis frameworks that, you know, I teach, I help develop. And then there's just tremendous amount of work on specific solutions. But in any given policy area, we need something that's in between. 
that helps people, whether they're in the education arena or the environmental arena or a health policy arena, to have a framework for thinking systematically about, about change. And I think that's been missing in many areas of, of public policy. And so this is a nice example for education, but one can imagine similar efforts in a range of different policy sectors that would really be helpful for advocates and analysts to make good progress. So I, I see this as a kind of um, a unique contribution that we don't have enough of that's bridging uh, you know, generic cost-benefit analysis, cost-effectiveness analysis, and detailed studies of specific policies. Thank you. Thanks. And so, last question. Can oh, I do one sure. Question? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think one of the reasons we looked at this was when you when you look at things like art education or athletic uh, uh, you know, PE in schools, people argue for it because it increases math scores. That to me is like an, an initial, like a clear indication that we're not thinking broadly about what we actually care about in schools. And so the hope is to get around that. Sorry. Yeah, and the last question will come from David. So I kind of had a bigger overall, so how do you think about, um, uh, so, so how do you think about capacities, uh, educational goods and capacities to flourish? within a capitalist mode of production that, you know, so I'm looking at economic productivity and personal autonomy that are definitely tied to the modes of production. And so to think about, so my question is, how does a capitalist mode of production impinge upon the various educational goods that lead to human flourishing that you're trying to advance through, through this framework? That's a great question. You want to oh, I see you're going to send that to me. Uh, so, I'm trying, I talked last, I don't understand. So I don't know, because I don't know, uh, to, I mean, to know that would, require a lot of knowledge about how things work, but also it requires a baseline of comparison. So I don't really know what the effects are unless I know what the counterfactual is that we're thinking about. Um, and I don't know enough about what the counterfactuals are. I mean, you know, I, so capital, you know, I sort of think Sweden, Sweden is capitalist, you know, uh, Denmark is capitalist, the US is capitalist, they're very different, the way that things work out. I mean, you know, the, the, the way that these things can get realized in those different societies with the different kinds of supports that people have are going to be different. Um, and so I can make those comparisons. I mean, you know, just at the, like, very high American levels of child poverty are just going to make it really, really difficult for schools to achieve lots of these things. I mean, they just do. And so you work, so, so you think, okay, so should we be changing child poverty? Yes, absolutely. Are we going to do that? I confess I'm a pessimist about that. So I think that I think the schools basically I don't think they should be I don't think they should lie and say, oh poverty's got nothing to do with this. No, poverty has a lot to do with it. But I also don't you know, I also don't think they should think uh, then they have to think, okay, what can we do in our circumstances given our constraints, whatever they are. And a school teacher, a school principal, a district leader cannot affect the poverty rate in any significant way. A president can and a state and a governor can, and, you know. I, I also think that we're, we are capitalists, but we're not only capitalists. Like, we care about other things besides economic productivity. And while we have economic productivity as one of the things there, and we have it there because we don't have much of a safety net aside from the fact that, we, that it probably belongs there, it doesn't mean that these other things we don't think of as, as kind of important for who we are as people. So I, I think we're capitalists as a country, but it's not the only thing we are as a country. And uh, yeah. So on that note, thank you, Susanna and Harry.